Talk Spotlight series, the series that highlights the people, the companies, and the technologies that are shaping the future of retail. I'm one of your co-hosts for today, Chris Walton. And I'm Ann Mazinga. And today we have the pleasure of talking with someone we've known since his first debut as a startup on the Shop Talk stage. And for today's conversation, we'll be discussing the ever-evolving world of pricing. More specifically, what this gentleman thinks retailers are doing right and what they could be doing better when it comes to their pricing strategies. So with that, we'd like to introduce Alex Hawken, the CEO and founder of Compaterra. Alex, welcome to OmniTalk. It's great to have you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Annie, for inviting me. I'm a big fan of your podcast and so excited to be here finally. Yeah, Alex, it's really exciting to have you on. I mean, I remember being on stage with you when Compaterra was like, just just kind of coming onto the scene and it's been really fun to watch as things have developed over the past of past several years that we've been following your work um and so i i love before we get started to just kind of give the audience a little bit of your background and then uh we can go into kind of the backstory of Compaterra if you don't mind yes uh, so super thank you yeah, just long story short, I'm an engineer, born and raised in Ukraine, and my actually diploma was electronic nose that I built it. I trying to train computer to smell, and it was <laughs> new, not really I work. I have no idea yeah. about that. Really? <laughs> A computer can smell. Wow. Okay. Yeah, okay. it was still not there yet, right? Yeah, no, yeah. right? <laughs> And just imagine I used to neural networks back to 2005. It was actually seven years before Google acquired distributed neural networks and started thinking about AI. Right now we see that Pachai said, ah, Google is not a search company. Google is an AI company. Mm -hmm. But I'm really a long time with this. <laughs> what were yeah. you trying to solve for, Alex? Like what, were you, like, what was the impetus for trying to get a computer to have a sense of smell? Uh, it was a part of the diploma work. Actually, I'm having mm. a diploma as a medical engineer. Technically, mm -hmm. I study computer science and med tech science. And but back to, to like 2000s, it was really basic stuff. Yeah. And then, uh, like, long story short, was like uh, a lot of experience of building the products as an old sourcer. And then I was actually hunted by Deloitte. And I used to work with Deloitte Digital for like auditing a lot of projects. And actually, this was a part of the teams who was focusing on pricing advisory for brands and retailers globally. And guys, I see how like huge room of analysts spending hours uh, on doing the pricing adjustment using elasticity and excels, of course. And, uh, you know, like, and this is something like click in my head saying, cool, this is probably super inefficient. And of course, the cost of this very expensive and very slow. Like we can recalculate the prices like around six months and we can do it maybe faster, but it's still like very, very expensive. And then again, my background, I think, okay, cool. Probably machine learning can figure out how, what to do here. And actually it was rise of cloud as well. And uh, and uh, yeah, and just think probably we can combine this like machine learning, rise of cloud and knowledge how pricing should be done. And this is when we started. Technically it was 2014 when I first time get this to my mind. Uh, but also the good story to tell that is uh, was quite impossible. Before those cloud, the compute cost was so insane, guys. Right. And I came to the customer. I can't mention, but it was the huge groceries in London. Okay. And I said, guys, look, you doing this 17,000, uh, 700 product was done with our analyst team for them manually. I said, look, I can do it all. But on the shelves, it was around 17,000 items. I said, cool, guys, I can do it on 17,000 item size on the weekly basis. And pay me the same amount as you paid for these guys. Guess what they said? <laughs> yeah, no idea. Course. You tell us what they say. Yeah. Uh, they said, no way. Like, you should be <laughs> 10 times better and four times cheaper. <laughs> and it was cool. Of course, we shake the hands because what uh, you have as a startup, any chance, right? And right. I made a business. The first thing I took, like, it was around 300,000 pounds we agreed on. And I paid Google to 160 from this money. They say, cool, nice business. I made a great business for Google. <laughs> yeah. And uh, But the, the things evolved too much. And from 2014, we actually start training the model, making this data lake. You know that AI is not only about science. It's all about data 
labeling, structuring, and saving. Why I really big believer that Tesla autonomous vehicles is most advanced because they start collecting data in 2008 and start making all this stuff right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And in, in 2017, late 2017, we finally got the model with optimal margin and what can really works and actually was uh, affordable. And the second thing happens actually, uh, thanks for blockchain. Mm. Why? Because most of the cloud providers since 2000, uh, actually 16, switched to GPUs instead of CPUs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a huge uh, change happens in terms of like AI getting closer and closer to us. If you know, like again, famous OpenAI also started in 2014. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they did start with researchers. But yeah, this big thanks for actually blockchain in the first glance that they made those calculations cheaper. Still is expensive. We have also a few customers who can't even guys calculate the cost for them. That is still like some some limitations in this space. So, Sorry for the long answer background, but no, <laughs> so is... so help me understand. So how does blockchain play into what you're doing with pricing then? Explain that for the audience. Uh, okay, great. That the mining, the mining process. The mining. The, we mm -hmm. mine when you do did the mining, you did on the GPUs, right? On graphic mm -hmm. processors, not CPUs, because mm -hmm. it was it started there but shifted there. And it was a huge adoption for the video cards, right? And they, there was huge shortage on the whole market. And and then and this is reality. I don't remember 16, 17, mm -hmm. where the cloud providers switched to the GPUs globally, Google, Amazon, everyone. Right. Yeah, and this is coming to AI space. And you see right now we expecting an NVIDIA just announced a few days ago the yep. new type of chip would be even more uh productive and uh, yeah, I hope the compute will go down uh, because AI is everywhere right now. So the but, switch to GPUs essentially helped you because you get more processing then. Is mm -hmm. that the right way to think about it? Yeah, the margin margin gets right because mm -hmm. we even spoke with it the, like say like second biggest retailer right now in the world. And they said, guys, we're really worrying that how much it would be in compute. And uh, mm -hmm. and this really works me as well <laughs> on their size. It's still like, but it works and this is most important. So Alex, explain for me then, like, how are you approaching this then with some of the retailers that you've been talking to? Like, how did you go from 17,000 SKUs with a grocer in the UK to now expanding this up as the compute power allows for faster processing, but then also as, as Competera has kind of developed? I mean, honestly, it's still like uh, since last year also that I always think I'm super grateful for two things in the world. The first one, blockchain due to GPU shift. And second one to Sam Altman, who make the AI something what people really start trust in. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's still like uh, good to know, like from 2018, when we officially uh, announced it, to start working on that publicly. And computer actually was registered in late 2017, like November. Uh all the customers who are used to us, they still with us. We have hundred percent logo retention since then. When they tried, they still it's, they stick with us and saying, Alex, we can't imagine we can do it like any any again manually or like 50, 30 people was involved in this pricing and the big assortment now is one, two people just need it. Wow. Yeah. And but still for me, even now it's hard to convince in really hard. Like because or they can't evaluate, or all the cars look the same for the customers. And honestly, the big Big companies who in this market for 30 years, they was really hard pitching against us. Oh, this is a black box. And it's why now we, we will touch this point maybe later that we're using like contextual machine learning. It means that this we can interpret why price was changed and what was the reason behind. Uh, but yeah, but it was really hard to convince, to be honest. Like, oh, the startup from the Europe, especially in the United States, it's really right. hard also. Right. So Alex, so strip it back for us right now. Let's, let's kind of reset the conversation a little bit too. Like what fundamentally in like one or two sentences is, is the value proposition of Competera that you tell retailers? Mm -hmm. uh, from, we, we actually say that guys, we can help you to be on, uh, to price beyond elasticity. Okay. It means that we can bring the optimal price hyper local, what will be optimal in the eyes of your customers. And of course, we'll make your margin. And our average customer, like uh, average number of the improvement is a six person gross profit improvement without losing any revenue targets. Just imagine how big this impact for retailers is like, is insane. And they, <laughs> Alex, it sounds too good to be true, but it's true. And I will say to trust us, not, not trust us, just test us. Give me a few categories, five stores and six weeks time. And you will Got see it. it. Okay. 
Got it. Well, it sounds like, and it sounds like we've got the the right person for this this conversation because he's goodness. got a nose for AI, pun intended. Yes. Um, and to that point, Alex, like pricing is is definitely a lever. Like it's probably the biggest lever to drive demand uh, that retailers have for the most part. And so, you know, we've talked a lot on our show about the importance of AI pricing. But like we said, you're the expert here. You're the guy with the nose for what it means. Um, why do you feel? It's important for retailers to embrace an I in an I an AI based approach to pricing. Yeah, again, uh, this is now is a very modern world. Everyone giving the names of their AI. We don't have it. We still call it like version fifteen because, like, <laughs> my engineer passed not giving names for the algorithms. I don't know. There's a crazy fifteen trend children last year. to name is too many. Yeah, you just have to go yeah, to numbers at that point. Fifteen. And you know, that is uh, the only reason actually, guys, why I started, because when I saw those software, they technically was relatively quick to deliver the new price from technically Excel on steroids. I mean, that they was care about price automation, how to bring the new price to the store when actually reason for repricing was the cost change or competitors. Technically, the reactive pricing. We always do changes when something is already happens, mm -hmm. but this is not how you win the world. And with the vision, how I had that moment to say, I need to make the price proactive. It means that for me, competitor is not a trigger. Competitor is a factor. And okay. we have now around 20 factors, including like store location, day of the week, weather, dependent items on the shelf, promotion happening in that particular store, or if that store that is at the small, maybe this cluster of the stores. And of course, the customer behavior on, for example, the Target store in the middle of Manhattan is a different from even Target store in the middle of the Las Vegas, right? Mm -hmm. But usually we have the same pricing. We actually also touch a lot of topics on your podcast about the personalization is a huge topic, many, many years, but come on. What we I know, like how most of the we just recently launched the research regarding the price index, uh, like price maturity of the retailers in the United States, and it's a disaster, guys. They still like very, very outdated. And what we can say about personalization if we treat the customer in the middle of Las Vegas the same as the middle of Manhattan? What I don't even say that is a different state taxes between uh, Nevada and uh, New York, right? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, that's, for an the long point. that's an interesting point. I've never thought about the diff there's differences in taxes, which would impact your differences mm -hmm. in pricing across the states too. I've actually, and, my and the buying power is different. Why yeah. everyone knows that we need to do something different than online comparison mm -hmm. to offline. Mm -hmm. But for us, by the way, online is that that's just a channel. The same, like for me, is like if you have hundred store and online is hundred and one store because online different behavior, different buying power, different actually the way of consumption, et cetera. This is what AI technically enable us. We have no limits. We can bring the optimal price in a different context. Now everyone finally know the prompting, right? The context. This is why I call it this contextual ML. Uh, technically the, that we give the algorithm, hey, this is your context. This is a store of middle of nowhere. This is like so many people coming here back and forth. He's a shelf. He's my stock. He's my promotion plans. And he's my actually digital or sorry, like my marketing span for that store. This all the context, all the data, what we can input to the algorithm and say, hey, please. And what I need, of course, I say, hey, cool. I need better profit and please keep my revenue. Or I want revenue growth, but be not so hard on, on margins or don't care about margin. And then yeah, I can calculate your optimal price position and they can do it every day, every week. Um, How often you something. want, right? Yeah. Really. yeah. And that's the thing, right? Yep. Well, and Alex, explain a little bit where the consumer comes into this too, like as a factor alongside the things that you were just talking about. I mean, consumers are paying close attention, especially like I always think of when we go, when we have discussions about pricing on here, I think of things like eggflation and like some of the, the key items in the store that are really key drivers for consumers when they're making a decision about where they're going to shop and how, like, how does, how do things like that factor into this for the retailers that you, uh, with? you know, uh, do you have, do we want honest answer or uh... <laughs> no, we want, no, no, we don't want honest, candid <laughs> answers, Alex. No, that's not our reputation at all. Um, you know, I really can be really honest with you. Retailers don't really 
care much about the end consumers. It can be controversial, but what I have I seen is they so hard and so far from them. I call this a fifth level of, uh, for me, sorry, we got this with the Gartner. We made like five levels of the price maturity. And the third level is exactly the, where you can use the machine learning or demand based pricing with the forecast technique to make your pricing proactive, not reactive. But they still, guys, can consider only the product behavior, store, all this stuff. The customer technically is like, approximate metric about around the traffic and the consumption curve that we know the x by the x consumption looks like that the avocados like that this customer technically is not in the formula and by the way optimization targets is not there all the retail optimization targets sorry especially for the public companies about gross profits about <laughs> margin is not optimizing for customers sorry and the fifth level of growth we call this where and the, uh, sorry, and the cluster is usually the store, as we mentioned, the store location, the group of the stores, group of the products. And a fifth level, I, uh, we call this personalized contextual pricing, like where optimization target became LTV. Mm -hmm. And only one retailer in the United States, as far as I know, who doing that today. And you never guess who is it. As a company, you know it. It's like uh, Fortune, from Fortune 5. Fortune and it's not 5? It's it's exactly. not happening or it is happening. It's not Apple and not. Apple. It's not Apple. Okay, well, can you tell us? Tell us who it is. Google. Google. Google stores. Uh, we spoke very often, and the guy is saying they can't. This imagine that you can calculate LTV with a certain level of the accuracy, and they say, guys, we know this small cluster of these people will spend with us next sixty months. I don't know actually why sixty, but <laughs> something like sixty months. This amount of money. And just imagine how you can really uh, price your product knowing that. By the way, in the gaming industry, mm -hmm. this, they already in gambling and gaming, they know it and they calculate it very well. Mm -hmm. And that we can learn from them because they, first of all, care about customer behavior and clusters and do the price adjustment based on behavior and actually prediction of this customer willing to pay. Retail has a lot of limitations starting from the manufacturer cost, the blah, blah, blah. It's a lot of... Limits, but the good news we having right now one customer doing this fifth level of growth, and this is guys dark stores. Guess what? They don't have a this is we uh, call price discrimination trap, where how to deliver differentiated price to the end user. You need to run this like kind of shopping or carts, etc. And it's why the the mobile native retailers, the dark stores, they have this uh, ability, right? They just having an app. And right. they didn't have a web store. And that's why they can really do very cool personalized pricing. Is it two problems then? Yeah. But sorry is, for is, long time. So, no, it's good though, but it's good because it, it, what you're touching on is a little bit of kind of the nirvana that, man, we were talking a lot more about it five or six years ago than we have recently. And, but, you know, the, the analogy to the casino industry and knowing, you know, exactly what your customer is and how much they're going to spend and what the propensity is that they're going to spend money with you given all the different yeah. factors that are at play. And so, so Alex, what makes that, what makes that such a different, difficult challenge for retailers to approach their business in that manner? Uh, first of all, data foundation, still, okay. still fun. Still fun, data is not there. And we okay. mostly, I thought guys, when we found the computer, I thought I will spend more time on model training for each retailer in different contexts, in different industries. Yeah. We're spending more time on data clearance, guys, and transformation still. Even retailers right. buying like Snowflakes, Google, but you know, they still like, sorry, but rule the garbage in, garbage out. They, be, yeah. they bought the big tables, but they're still putting their garbage. <laughs> and to make the pricing on the customer level, just imagine the complexity and actually, and the size of data set. But this the, 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 the future is really bright. And I see this adoption is coming. Um, but yeah, data foundation is a main blocker from making the price, uh, like targeting, for example, LTV and some specific micro group of users. By the way, you know, in America, we don't have a GDPR, right? But in Europe, we have. And I mm -hmm. think, honestly, the GDPR is not something bad. I still think that we don't need to overconsume data because it's actually not right. And mm -hmm. even right now, design that that the price should be tailored for some specific mini group of users. It's like, okay, that is like, looks like this is still a group is a cohort is not individual. Mm -hmm. Like for individual, the marketing can do some like uh, marketing touch, but in the global adoption is still. So Chris, this is a data foundation. What even huge retailers, multi-billion dollar retailers really, really bad on that. 
Got it. So Alex, let me ask you a question then, like, cause you got me thinking about this. Like if that's the Nirvana and those are the roadblocks, does the approach you're, you're espousing lend itself more to retailers that have smaller assortment sizes? I'm thinking like QSRs, for example, where they have just like, you know, five, six, seven items on the menu versus like a Walmart or a Target that probably has a hundred thousand SKUs is, Am I correct in thinking about that in that manner? Or, or or is that where we'll see the adoption first towards this type of thinking from a retail perspective? Like, what's your thoughts there? Uh, you know, the fun fact that for small retailer or the big retailer, it can be the same problems on their side. I okay. mean, the data foundation, the same is like, again, with the, it's just a question of the compute. I will probably, we can share the screen, but maybe afterwards, I will show you what we did just in Gmail for Amazon and Shopify sellers. It's okay. like, but Kinsey kind report coming generated completely by AI in two hours coming to your inbox. And for us, like they are exactly example. Like is usually the average Amazon seller is like sell five, seven items, private label. Mm -hmm. I don't take these drop shippers into account. They're not retailers, they're yeah. just uh, traffic gamblers. I don't know how to say. Yeah. But um, yeah, this is about the what the advice for the listeners can say, guys, if you thinking about investing in the data please do i think still some retailers considering building products internally build the data is the data information regarding the customer their behavior this is your main product and then you can buy and plug in any other vendor specific for pricing for promo for assortment but your product is data clear cool data what can be transparent anyway and be easy acceptable if you can say that if you wish like your personal data lake and this is something what retailers just, even if we know all this big data boom was in beginning of 2015, 14, but then BI, then people realized that BI is useless because someone need to look on these dashboards. <laughs> and uh, and now there's a new era. I say, all call it this era, like AI eating software, right? You don't need another tool, another SaaS coming every morning. Chris, like we, even sometimes like Gmail or inbox is too much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we're living in a nice era that uh, the software will disappear. Yeah. This AI will work. Yeah. Well, nice. and I know that's, I know that's the question Anne has for you too. Cause when we were talking about this beforehand, you know, like for me, it was like, okay. Cause there's the, the business intelligence side, which is basically what you just talked about. Like we can run a McKinsey report that used to take months to put together. We can do it in two hours, I think is what you said. Right. And, and I'm a big believer in that, but but Ann, I know you've got, you, when you were talking to me before, you've got a lot of questions on like, okay, that's one thing. But then when you start talking about acting on the pricing intelligence. Yeah, what to do with it. Yeah, like that's your question, right? So Yeah, I mean, yeah, Alex, I think understanding, first of all, for the audience who's listening, we went through the very complex process of sorting through the data that you're getting in. But now, like, some retailers are still only updating prices once a year. Like now they have this information. They're only able to get through that data to update prices once a year. You told me how, how is that possible? First of all, and second, like, you know, what, what can AI and ML come in to do and Competere come in to do that can shorten this process for, for retailers and really make it tangible for them? Because this can be really overwhelming, I think. Uh, yeah, is it is uh, any honestly? <laughs> still, like for a lot of them is overkill. Saying, "Oh, we need to review our." Some retailers still printing those magazines and they sell it through the paper magazines. Yeah, right. The, and yeah. Uh, and I think my opinion: this train is already moving. Or you, or you jumping, or you stay. Uh, there's no other option. And they need to adopt. They need to see that again. And. You see, this all is honestly made by big, big four. I was one of the team who also made the statement like dynamic pricing and not something good. I never say like dynamic pricing. I say, mm -hmm. again, it's a big difference between price optimization and dynamic pricing. I think price review, it doesn't mean change of the price. You, we all know that Amazon reviewing their prices every 15 minutes, but it doesn't mm -hmm. mean they change the price every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as well as we made it, we made it twice touch the McKinsey. And I, when I was Deloitte, the customer called me and said, Hey, Alex, can we keep that $4.99 for milk or not? I say, Yeah, keep it as the best price. This advice stay is also advice. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think retail shouldn't afraid and to do these adjustments faster. But honestly, they even not mentioned, but they do because cost is changing when it was mm -hmm. crazy inflation times. And, and it helps technically to uh, to them thinking about, oh, cool, we should be more 
uh, 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 reactive here. And any back to your question. Uh, yeah, what do they do here? Like, what's the what's the approach they can take? How do how do they shorten that timeline? Yeah, uh, the first of all, the main blocker is the people in any process and some uh, bias position. And all the conversation what I had is all about oh, we never changed. For example, we reviewing our KVIs last year or six mm -hmm. months ago. The best yeah. case. It's okay. Who is doing it? Okay, we did it with one of the consulting companies. Okay, I say this is. Do you think that people again? Let's take the same example. We all coming to shop talk later this week. You think that is a KVIs in Las Vegas similar in grocery to KVIs in Manhattan? Probably no. not, right? No. no. But if you you ask the Coca Cola, they will say, of course, this is our key value item. This is a small bottle of Coca Cola, and they write in general, they write. But this have nothing to do with your store and that particular place, etc. Where sometimes the local brand or your private brand brands even looks better and more native to the local audience. Yeah, and this minds were like start right asking right questions. Uh, do we really need to stick to this bias position that we we think we're doing right, or just try? And I will say, guys, let's just see what data say, and how much gross profit we left on the table due to this position due to this uh, very, very slow price reaction. So I want to make sure that's it's coming out. So you're, you're basically saying that there's a lot of value in just the intelligence side, going back to mm -hmm. the dichotomy here. There's a lot of value in the intelligence side because, because Anne's question is one thing, but the second part of that question, you know, can, can you change more regularly is, especially when you start talking about physical retailing, there's a cost to making changes. And so mm -hmm. this idea of, you know, I can change my prices whenever I want to, when at, you know, at any point in the day, there's a cost to that. So like, how do you yeah. think of the balance between intelligence and then acting on it when there are real people that need to make those price changes, real signs that need to be printed, or maybe real shelf tags that need to be updated electronically, all of which has a cost. So like, where is the balance there in trying to manage that for retailers as they're thinking about this? Because pricing is definitely on their mind. But those are the things where heads are exploding right now, I'm sure, as they're listening to this conversation. Yeah, the executives right. listening, they're like, okay, I want to do this, but like there's got to be a limit to it. So how do you what advice do you have for them in that in that regard? Good news. Even in the computer, we have the very small trigger saying we don't try to change something in terms of your labor cost. We say, okay, how many price tags are you changing right now weekly? And usually retail change the weekly. And they say 400. And that's what happens. We're just giving the CI also prompt saying got it. Give me 400 price changes was gives approach. me this gross profit lift. That's it. We will not change everything every day. It's changing only single time. Second so your thing. operating structure stays the same week in and week out. That's a really smart exactly. approach. I like that. Okay. Yeah. Ian, but we see how many, for example, especially when we're just starting is a, is a huge disbalance in the shelves. And even in retail of 7,000 items, probably yeah, I want to change around 2,000 in the first glance. But we limit there. And of course, this cell will help to adopt it. But honestly, again, EI is not want to change something if the context is not changed or this index is what we calculated is not changed. They not play with the price. It means that the idea is to find the optimal place and stay as long as possible in this optimal place. It's how algorithm is never biased. Is it not a human? They want mm -hmm. to try to, ah, what if, right? Or, oh, this guy's changed the price. I need to react immediately. They Got know it. It. these guys always do this, uh, but yeah. they have a limited stock and usually they go out of stock every Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, and I will not react because it's no sense because I will not grow my price any back. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the answer is the need to do often. For example, for offline, we even even stick for weekly updates. Can be okay. even bi weekly, but would not recommend to go less because it's too too long. AI don't getting any respond. They need to respond that retrain model is retrained. Right. You know the ChatGPT retrained like twice a year. Right. Yeah, and it's super expensive. We do the same, but on the mm -hmm. weekly basis. It means that, that we allow them to grab the context, including like traffic information, new store, location of your competitors. It should be updated at least weekly. It's best uh, daily, amazing. But you're right, daily, no one will do it. It's really expensive. So, but yeah, that's, some... so that's a really good nugget that you're just saying that, that I want to make sure we put a pin in for the executives listening because like you're basically saying like you should do this within your current operating model. You don't need to. You don't need to do more. And ideally, if I heard you right, then the potential output of this is that you're actually doing less price changes over time 
than than more and because you want the models to set in the correct manner is that right yeah this is the nature okay. of algorithm to Very put cool. you in what you call optimal price and keep them as long as possible that is yeah and honestly we see historically a reduction of numbers of the price changes over the time right not okay. increasing because they are already optimal is when you go to the gym and you became the, the, the in nice form and you're just keeping those form right right uh yeah right you're starting from a place that is more informed than just going week by week by week or month by month uh based on you know what my competitors are doing for example or what the cost is for me as a retailer um I wonder if you, this is a very heady conversation for me and I'm sure for some of the listeners as well. I'm sorry but to be my technical. <laughs> no, this is great. It's great. We're learning so much. Um, I I wonder if you can help in, in again, kind of going into what you're doing at Competera with a couple of case studies or examples. We have a brand, I know that we can mention this. This is LVMH company, a starboard. Okay. This, is a, uh, this is a cruise ships. Okay. And we price oh. 42 cruise lines based guys on the destination point. And okay. means that the AI challenge is that we know this is a premium or is a standard and where it's going. And the idea is, to, of course, to increase the consumption on the boat, not offshore. Okay. Okay. And, yeah. And if you arrived in Paris, you need to continue shopping in our duty free, right? And on the, on the, on the liner. And, and of course, they all this uh, stuff. But yeah, that is a very cool setup when there's 42. It's technically a shopping mall on the water, right? Right, uh, right. Uh, yeah. But we just, then we realized oh, it is moving. And we just, we crawled, we also collect a lot of data, right? It's like not, uh, by the way, we not mentioned this, but ML not working only on the retail data. We collect a lot of data outside, like uh, traffic information, price, competitor prices, weather, hyper local events. Weather, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this combined in this data set. And it seems like your iPhone, when you're typing, yeah, you're getting this. If you will train only on your algorithm, Chris, maybe it will take 20, 30 years to get to the point that we can suggest your next board because it's too much, too, too little inputs. Right. And, and, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And just imagine for us the challenge saying, okay, we, we collect data on the all destination points. We know what is going on and algorithm know what the, when this and the repricing happens overnight yeah. because they usually shift at night, right? You, when you sleep, the, the ship is moving to the new location and the price is also changing. Uh, yeah, this is fun case study. <laughs> no, that's great. So God, yeah, they, I never thought about that either. The, I'm, learning, I'm thinking about a lot of new things now. This is great. So yeah, the, the floating shopping malls too. I've never thought about that either. But um, do you have any, do you have, so... What's 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 on the horizon for pricing? Like, do you have any predictions for where it's headed next? <clears throat> no, As like a science. Touched, yeah, the, you touch this today. Uh, is the personalized pricing, of course, mm -hmm. uh, make it more personalized, and especially you see this is Gen Zs. They're growing in absolutely personalized environment, and you see those. Uh, we right now see the rise of this TikTok shopping. Technically, the world is going backwards, right? We all this our grandmother sitting on the TVs and doing this uh, shop on, on the TikTok. Right. The same is new again. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's really booming. And this is uh, something what I see even will be accelerate. And again, I, for the all retailers who really was afraid of that people is ready. They giving this gamification experience everywhere, mm -hmm. of course, starting on the flight tickets and this coming to the retail as well. And, and yeah, and again, I think in this environment where you also guys mentioned many times in your podcast that the labor cost increased, the inflation right now is better, but no one knows. I feel still like the market recession is coming, but just maybe just was delayed because world is busy in other thing right. <laughs> with the wars, with the COVID and say, okay, let's wait at that, but they come. And even the small, teeny retailers like groceries is most uh, challenging industry from the gross margin perspective. They desperately need it because that that is actually helps to make your price perception because again, you create your price perception even without making the purchase, right? Because you come to the store, you see something like, uh, for example, you want, you love the cereals and it was destroyed by price of milk and you not bought cereals because milk was insane. And this is something what 
uh, should be considered and they, they need to be there. And yeah, this personalized pricing with adoption of SL and better data flow and retail will use as more and more machine learning in different perspectives, not only for pricing, for promo optimization, for uh, for assortment is already there, right? And the replenishment stuff, et cetera. That well, we yeah, I mean, really Alex, something that I've learned here throughout this conversation is that there are which many people listening know, like there are so many more factors and inputs going into what ultimately determines pricing where we are right now. And even more that will come into play as we go into the future. And you start to try to get even more personalized with your pricing offerings. You try to even do things to benefit your loyal customers over other customers that are just walking in, like the complexity is only going to grow. So um, I, it makes a lot of sense that you would start to invest in a, a platform that can help you manage that because it's certainly not going to be happening manually. Yeah, exactly. That is, uh, this we passed the world where the things was manual or just automation. Again, yeah. a lot of software guys, what we interact is about automation, but not about optimization. Right. Yeah, and of course we can create a nice wars when we do automation is also optimization, but not with that all the data what you have right now you don't need to uh, think anymore. <laughs> of right. course you know you need. Actually, the fun that you not touch the point that because I also heard very often that hey you're doing this that you will this is people will fire it. AI is replacing the jobs, uh, but no one calculate how much AI create the new jobs, yeah. right? And for us they saying still human in place as you can't work with ChatGPT alone, right? You need to prompt him properly, yeah, right. see the future. And the, right now the Train human the will just pointing the directions and putting the guardrails and play with the guardrails. My users right now, they're just playing with the limits. Oh, what happens if I put limit like that or like that? And they still need to see and what is doing, but they're not spending time. And we have this promotion that we just launched. We're saying we, uh, our mission is to actually uh, f unlock your time for more available things. And these available things, like you grab your kids from kindergarten earlier, because when I was sitting in Deloitte with the red eyes from 8 a.m. till late 2 a.m. at yeah. night to complete the repricing of this store, and I know how many all these merchants still doing that, it's insane. That's like, again, guys, it's something more advanced than human brain exists. Yeah, and this already here. Yeah. Well, on that on that note, we'll close it up. I mean, I think my brain hurts already. I mean, we've definitely got the expert on pricing here uh, at a technical level. A technical level, excuse me, uh, unparalleled for this show. So, so Alex, if if people want to get in touch with you, pick your brain, learn more, go in, even more in depth for the super geeks out there about what we just talked about, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, please follow me in LinkedIn. It's really quite, we, I posting a lot of stuff. We're actually preparing like a webinar for A-B testing in pricing. We will show the different ways of testing, like how we need to be sure that you're doing the right things. Mm. Also, we all coming to Shop Talk. We'll be happy to meet in person. Yeah. And oh, awesome. You're going to be out at Shop Talk too? All right, cool. We'll have to, we'll have to meet up yeah. when we're out there. So so people should just get in touch with you through LinkedIn and, uh, and, and give Alex a ping. All right, well, that wraps us up. Thanks to Alex Halkin of Competera for sitting down with us. And thanks to all of you for tuning in as usual. And on behalf of all of us at Omni Talk Retail, and on behalf of Alex and Ann and myself, as always, be careful out there.